Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub. Welcome to part two of my meeting with a very special individual who's given a lifetime of service to the Jewish people through the JCRC, through the National Conference on Soviet Jewry, and as chairman of the Conference of Presidents of major American Jewish organizations, Richard Stone, who's currently a professor of law at Columbia Law School and the vice president of the America-Israel Friendship League. And I'm proud to say Richard is also on the board of JBS. He's a dear, dear friend. Thank you for joining him again. I appreciate your being here to continue the discussion. Glad to be with you, Mark. I want to talk about you when you were chairman of the Conference of Presidents of major American Jewish organizations. You were in a unique position to see things that you may not have even have seen when you were in organizational life. You certainly see things that most rabbis and most typical lay people never see. I want you to tell me if there was anything about that experience which in some way changed the way you view contemporary Jewish life and the relationship between American Jewry and Israel. My chairmanship was at a particularly peaceful time within the Jewish community and within, uh, between the Jewish community and the American government. The, the really difficult moments with, between Israel and the White House and the Obama administration were were mostly after after my term the, mm -hmm. the the Iranian treaty and Bibi's appearance on the stage of Congress occurred in the next one and so on so I didn't have to deal with that uh, there were a lot of really interesting important issues I took some great secret trips as you know the great privilege of the chairman of the conference is not just to be the ostensible leader of the American Jewish community but to work on a hour by hour daily basis with Malcolm Honlein, who I feel strongly is the greatest Jewish professional in our, of our time and a, a uniquely uh, uh, capable, talented person who has been a tremendous influence on my life since I met him on a cold call when he was head of the J Jewish Community Relations Council of New York in 1976. He heard there was some Jewish-minded professor, a young professor at Columbia Law School. We were both young then. And he called me and said, I want to meet you. And for the next 35 years, I was on the board of the Jewish Community Relations Council in New York. So I, I had some amazing experiences with him. But the, the, it, it was really a, a, a particularly quiet time. I don't know whether I, I wish that I had been part of some of the more uh, recent turmoil. The Iran issue was, was of course, the, the one that, that uh, all of our contacts with, with Israel were were centered on that issue because Bibi has for a long time, Bibi has been truly obsessed with that issue and I think a totally sincere way. I believe Bibi made his appearance in front of the United States Congress fully aware, not because he wanted to defy Obama, but because he just in his conscience could not uh, avoid doing anything he could to stop what he considered to be a potential, a potential disaster. Um, Were you critical of him for doing it? No. I was not. I, I, I wish that he, I wish that it hadn't had to be that way. I wish he could have gotten the clearance for it, but it wasn't going to happen. W would I have advised him to do it? Maybe not, because the stakes were very high to go there and lose. The stakes were high. But on the other hand, uh, it didn't lose. It just didn't get the majority that was needed to defeat it, because the way the Obama administration put it through is not a majority situation. But By the way, Congress never ratified no, absolutely the Iran not. deal. Absolutely not. It was never a formal treaty of the United States. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, but I, 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 I'm not sure I would have advised him to do it, but I would never would have criticized him even privately uh, for doing it. I thought. Okay. I asked you a slightly uh, different yeah. question, though. My question the, is, did your years as chairman give you a different perspective in any way? Yeah. They, 
I, w w with the responsibility of being chairman and th having to think hard all the time about keeping a consensus within the Jewish community, managing as best you can to keep a consensus, and to minimize, not that differences can't be expressed, but to contain differences to maintain one voice that can speak with consensus on the basic issue of particularly of support uh, for Israel. I, I, it didn't happen during my two years the way it happened subsequently. But I did get the sense that the American Jewish community was changing in a way that would accent not right wing and left wing, but committed and less committed. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, the, the move to in the part of some of the organizations who have very different constituencies from the ones that I came from, the move to be more openly critical, publicly critical of the of policies of the Israeli government they dis, disagreed with. Um, I saw it, I saw that coming and I saw that it would be something that we eventually would have to be, uh, would surface and have to be dealt with in a, in a painful way in, at the conference in some ways. But wait, spend a moment on that. Mm -hmm. Richard, to what extent do you feel it is appropriate or inappropriate for American Jewish organizations to take stands against Israeli policy? By and large, I think that it's inappropriate. Because? If the policies are policies, it's complicated because the Israelis have long wanted us to be their partners, and if we're their partners, then ostensibly we should be able to talk openly and criticize. The problem is, Mark, and you know it, the world is, 70 years after the Holocaust, the world has forgotten the Jews are a precarious people. Not, they're not just a powerful people with a now very powerful country. Jewish history is replete, to say the least, with horrific tragedies that were brought on because of hatred of Jews that seemed, would seem to have no rational basis. It seems to be inherent in the universe somehow. And the existence of the state of Israel I think changes the ground rules in many, many ways. So what I think is that when you, re when you just recently, with this incredible stuff that's taking place on the southern border in Israel, where there are hundreds and hundreds of terrorists trying to sneak over the border, for what purpose? Obviously to kill c Jewish civilians in as brutal a way as possible, to create as much pain and horror as possible, for whatever reason, they, this is what they want to do. And the Israelis are probably responding to it, by and large, with more patience and more moderation than any army in the history of the world, and certainly far less than, than we would, and far less than their critics would under the same conditions. And yet, day after day after day, it's reported uh, as unnecessary killings of innocent civilians. And we all know it's just, it's just a horrific lie. So in that environment, if a Jewish organization is critical of some policy of the Israeli government that's too nationalistic, too strong on defense, too right-wing, or whatever it is, it, it's not interpreted the way, it's, the way the criticism's intended. It's interpreted as agreement, even within the Jewish community, mm -hmm. about things that are not. It's the, it's the way in which our position is weakened unnecessarily and disproportionately by Jewish organizations in their capacity as Jewish organizations openly criticizing. Uh, we all have our pathways to talk. There's no major Jewish organization that can't get uh, senior Israeli government officials and even the prime minister on, on, on the phone once in a while and offer advice. But to go to the papers with it, to make press releases that criticize uh, is Israel's behavior in a way that isn't intended to be the way anti-Semitic criticism what is based, it, What is the intention? I don't know if you're giving them more credit than Maybe. they deserve. I'm trying, I'm I trying know, you're to. I'm trying to be sweet. Not sweet, I'm trying not to be, not to be um, too belligerent.
put it that way. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm trying to be sweet. I'm trying not to be too belligerent. <laughs> um, and, but I, I'm not sure what their intention is. I think... Isn't their intention, by the way, to change Israeli policy? Yeah, I think that... There's and, to, and also, in many instances, there's an attempt to move the American administration to take positions vis-a-vis -vis well, Israel that, there, there is that an element. pressure There Israel. is an element that wants that. There is an element that wants that. I don't, I don't know whether we want to name, the, there's a couple of elephants in the living room we could, we could be naming. Well, I am going to ask you about J Street and yeah. how you feel okay. about J Street. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think J Street, uh, there are, uh, my sense, I'm not an insider in J Street, but I'm an observer and a watcher, and I take Alan Dershowitz, uh, who's not a right winger, and. Uh, I think he said, Alan has said some of the most astute things about J Street. His analogy is to Jews for Jesus. Jews for Jesus says, come on, we're Jews. You can be Jews with us. And J Street says, we're pro-Israel. I'm, 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 I am distrustful of how pro-Israel J Street is. I think there's some naive hangers-on to J Street, but I think the essence of J Street is not so committed to Israel and not so pro-Israel. Okay, when you say right. committed, it's important that you define. Because if Jeremy ben was at this table, yes. he would say he's as committed to Israel as Richard Stone. What do you mean when you say... He's, but he's committed to it so long as it fits his extraordinarily liberal view of what Israel ought to be like. Which has, in my opinion, not only ridiculous ideological elements to it, but it's also completely unrealistic in terms of Israel surviving in the environment that it has to survive in. And it's so easy for Jeremy Benami, who has, I don't know, I don't know him well. I've been, uh, I've interviewed him and I've been with him in a non-personal setting and gotten to watch him closely. Uh, but, but he, he is, um, uh, he wants, Israel to exist as long as it fits his definition of what Israel ought to be like, which doesn't fit into the Middle East and, and, and has very little traditional Jewish content to it. You know, calling every, calling every um, liberal reaction the true Jewish tradition as Jews, don't we have to worry about these Palestinian, innocent Palestinian civilians? Of course, as human beings and as Jews, we have to worry about them. But the reality of the situation is Israel has no choice but to defend itself at that border. And I, 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 don't, I don't know how he doesn't understand that. But if he doesn't understand it, it's because he doesn't really want Israel to exist if it's not totally in his, in his uh, uh, image of what, a, of, of what a country ought to be like. I just don't get it. Um, I'm very happy for Israel to exist uh, as a strong Jewish refuge where Jews can uh, be safe and where Jews can be Jews as much as they want um, under, under virtually any political regime. I'm very happy across the political spectrum. I think that the Jewish left in America really dislikes the current prime minister. They and hate, I hate him. They yeah. hate the, yeah, I'm avoiding the words like hate. Although I don't know yeah. why. I don't know either. No, I mean, I'm serious. You know, why I, do they hate? Why do they hate Netanyahu? This, in part, because he's hung on so long, and and they haven't had any uh, refuge from him for, for a very long no, time. No, and they he, blame him for policies, and they blame him for not ending the settlement movement. Um, they don't feel he has been forthcoming in negotiations right. with Abbas. And I, they, they don't believe him. It, and I say to myself, I, I don't, say, know. I say I don't to, know why. I, don't I say know why. to them, what do you know about him? Right. You live here. The Israeli people have elected him. He's been doing a very good job internationally. Also, I have to the tell you. The economy is amazing. Amazing. He's, he's more popular internationally than probably. Any other Domestically Israeli prime as well. minister. Yes, right. by the way, I want you to know, I speak to many, many Israelis who say to me they don't like Netanyahu. And then you can't find a choice for Exactly him. right. But he's the best guy. Right. So Correct. we're going to stick with him. He's not lovable. I happen to like him, but he's not, he's not lovable. I, you I, know him personally. I, 
I know him personally. You I, like him personally? Yeah, I do like him personally. Uh, he he can be brusque and you know get and be in the wrong mood, but I like him personally. Uh, I'm a big fan, but. There is no one else. I, I've a number of times asked Bougie Herzog, for example. Bougie, you're a great guy. You're a smart guy. What would you do? What's, what's the difference? Define the difference between you and Bibi. And he can't. Isn't he says, I would, I would act different. I would do it. I would approach it differently. And I cannot find anything tangible. I said, how are you going to get elected when you can't? Let explain me explain the difference okay. between you and him. Let's go down this I, I think so. I, I've had the opportunity three times to, be, to deliver the introduction of BB to the Conference of Presidents at a ceremonial gala dinner in, in Israel. And each time I made it, I, I, I really spent time trying to figure out how to say something to put the Israeli Prime Minister in general, and BB in particular, into historic context. Um, and I've, I've got all these uh, remarks I've, uh, on paper one day. I'm put them, no one will ever read them, but uh, I'll put them in a collection. What I each time ended up saying was that the world owes an enormous debt of gratitude, whether you are politically aligned with the Prime Minister of Israel or not, the burden that the Prime Minister of Israel carries, the historic burden that he carries, making the ultimate decisions to defend that state are just an indescribably huge responsibility. And he lives with that on a 24-hour day basis. And I think you see it. And I think that things like his appearance before Congress to dispute his uninvited appearance or uh, unblessed by the White House experience of going to the Congress to dispute the deal in Iran you could disagree with it, but it's all from the heart from him. Mm -hmm. It's because he is obsessed with, he does not want to be responsible for what could happen if Iran is. He's going to do everything he can to stop it. The Jewish world ought to be grateful to him for that, whether you agree or disagree, whether you're a Jew who thinks that we should have signed that mindless treaty with Iran or one who thinks we shouldn't have. You should appreciate where where he's coming from and what and what his life is like 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. By the way, there are those also in America now who are furious right. at him for permitting yes. the Western Wall deal to fall apart. What's your reaction? Well, I have some views about that that not all your people are going to necessarily uh, agree with. First of all, I think that the issue of non-Orthodox prayer at the Western Wall is one that I'd love to see solved. If it was up to me, I would have gone through with the deal, give them, if, if there were no other repercussions from it. Even though I think American Jews really have to start to understand that the liberal movements have no real place in Israel. They're so tangential. The average secular Israeli doesn't go to shul, but it's, it's an orthodox shul he doesn't go to and doesn't want anything else. And if you made him choose to go to a shul, he'd only go to an orthodox shul, whether they have explicitly negative attitudes about other denominations or not. So the issue, it's the whole need for those movements is not relevant to existence in Israel. Meanwhile, and I'm going to maybe introduce a topic that you weren't expecting, what really is incredibly important in Israel, and I think Bibi understands this better than any other prime minister in Israeli history understands it. Certainly Ben-Gurion didn't understand it. What is really important in Israel is that you have, miraculously and unbelievably, an exploding Haredi community in Israel that is not assimilating into secular culture and needs very badly to become economically self-sufficient and to find a way to fit better into Israeli society because yes, it's there and there to okay. stay. And I want to make sure we understand each other. 
you would acknowledge this is a very serious social issue for Israel to confront. I think it's, this, other than, than outside security, I think that uh, making sure that the Haredi community becomes a productive part of Israeli society, at least a self-sufficient part of Israeli society, and does not become a demographic nightmare, is maybe the single most important social okay. security also, issue my, in Israel. I, I want to see if you want, your experience and mine are the same. My experience is that the overwhelming number of Israelis, as well as American Jews, do not want Israel to be controlled by, dominated by, a Haredi Jewish experience. I agree with that, but uh, I think that you have no choice but to allow the Haredi community to continue to exist and grow in Israel. I, I don't want the Haredi community to, to control the Israeli government, but the issue the incendiary nature of the issue of that spot of the Kotel, um, which is 99% of the non-tourists who attend, who go to the Kotel, are religious Jews, and a huge percentage of them are Haredi Jews. Absolutely, but it and is it is a major spot for world Jewry as I, well. I, 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 Mark, I started off by saying that if it were up to me, if if it could be done and people wouldn't go crazy over it, there's no question I that it would be you. much better. But at the moment, I think everybody accused Bibi of taking momentary, momentary uh, uh, political considerations and not wanting his coalition to fall Holy, apart. Why wasn't but, that wholly legitimate, Richard? Yeah, I've asked that, your I've asked that, uh, what prime minister in the it, world it, it is would, let, would let his, his government co fall over this? It is legitimate, but I think there's something deeper there. I think that Bibi really understands strategically that down the line, I think he would love to get this over with and of give course. them what they wanted and of go course. through with the deal. But I think he understands that strategically he has a major challenge to to, and there's a lot of progress that's been Finish made on thought. it. A major challenge to keep the Haredi community from resisting more than it has integration into at least some integration into Israeli society and becoming. But how does this? How does the wall issue play into that? Because I think that you antagonize. There's a lot of stuff going on in Israel, and you solidify the most extreme elements in the Haredi community by showing the holiest site in the world being occupied, being uh, utilized and prayed in by people that they consider to be some kind of d some demonic force. Okay, by the way, and I am very sympathetic to the orthodox claims of the Western Wall. I don't understand how it applies to Robinson's arch at all, and I don't understand why Israel wouldn't want to make a statement, a very important statement. That world to, Jewry is welcome. That's correct. And, and we're really talking about American Jewry. The reality is that outside yes, of, of America, it's of almost all Orthodox anyway. Right. Or, or lapsed Orthodox. That is correct. One or the other. Right. But so you're dealing with what symbol do you want to have that embraces American Jewry? Now, I have, I've written against American Jewish leaders saying, because of this move, right. we're going to withhold aid of one kind or another to Israel. That is despicable. We support Israel even when Israel might do something that offends right. us. But I don't understand why the, the need and the, the benefits of embracing American Jewry, which is basically non-Orthodox, isn't of a isn't at least as valuable as keeping Haredi happy at the Western Wall? Tough question. I think that I think that he made the decision in this moment and probably something that will be reversed. And again, I'm not arguing for what for what he did. I'm trying to explain uh, his mentality and and the and the kinds of challenges he faces. And and what I think he's thinking is just to maybe complete. Again, I'm not saying yes. I agree, but I think he's saying this, the element that, that of the American Jewish community that will not be able to understand this, that will be so offended that it will withdraw support from us, 
is an element that's not going to support us, whose support we're not going to have for a long, long time term. anyway. Anyway, interesting. That's interesting. But but the Haredim are there to stay, and and it it's outrageous that maybe that the Haredim can't tolerate Robinson's Arch being segregated in this way, but that is that is the reality, and I think he made a calculated decision not just based on his coalition, but on a long-term view of the importance of nursing along the Haredi community in a way that he thinks would be beneficial. Maybe. Yeah. So Richard, why is there no peace between Israel and the Palestinians? Oh, that's the simplest thing. It's the, it? simplest it's the thing. simplest thing. It's so question. simple. Because they don't want to acknowledge a, a state of Israel with any borders. It doesn't matter what borders there are. They don't want this foreign presence. They don't want any state of Israel under in any borders. Who's they? The core of the uh, the Palestinian leadership, the core of the Palestinian, whoever is uh, ruling the Palestinian people and making the real decisions so far has never acknowledged the willingness to admit that this, a, any state within any borders should exist in that okay. area. Richard, isn't this clear? I think so. Well, why doesn't everybody get it? Why are there people who argue that the reason there's no peace is because there are settlements? settlements. It's insane. What, what the hell was there in 67? Nobody heard of settlements. In 67, the whole Arab world attempted to destroy the state of Israel. They never accepted the state of Israel. And then Egypt accepted, got, got its land back. Well, I mean, we all know this history so well. The real question is, why doesn't the world grasp this? Well, I think it's possible that, not, not for the most wonderful reasons, but maybe the amazing transformation of the attitude of the Sunni Arab world to Israel, necessitated by their mutual fear of the Iranian threat. Uh, there's, not, there's not that much room between Bibi and, and some of the Sunni states in terms of their uh, view of Iran. Uh, but the ground-shaking difference in the relations those people have with Israel all of a sudden, which are supposedly quiet and secret, but they're not the slightest bit secret, in my opinion. It'll be a, a good day when they become a little more explicit, but the, it's the worst, world's worst kept secret. Um, and, and certainly if people, like, if people like myself go to those countries, which I have a number of occasions, uh, you, you hear praise of Bibi that's as articulate as any you've ever heard. You hear declarations of how much we look forward to living in normalcy with the state of Israel. And during the Obama administration, you heard, particularly after the Iranian uh, deal was made, you heard the most vehement denunciations of the United States president that you would hear from anywhere in the entire world, including his, uh, his Republican opposition in America. Okay. I want to know, though, from you, what's your feeling about why American Jews don't understand it as simply as it is. It's as clear as day. It, there's nothing Israel could do, nothing right. Israel could do. No policy it could change, no settlement it could tear down. It, it, nothing Israel could do. There could, you could, about, imagine, you about, could imagine ultimately. It's not about Netanyahu. It's about a, a, a Palestinian leadership which believes Israel has no right to be at all. At all. And therefore, you know, I, I say to people, uh, what percentage is Israel's fault that there's no peace? And somebody will say to me, 15%. Most mm -hmm. well, somebody say, 5%. I said, what's the 5%? Yeah. There is, but with very few things in life are black and white. Yeah, this is. American Jews have to understand in this tragic human situation, Richard, it's black and white. Israel is zero because Israel is ready to make concessions. And you have another side which says, we don't want to make, we don't want you to exist at all. I'm asking you, why don't American okay. Jews, why are there American Jews who don't get it? Let me give you my guess. It dates back to other things that we've said in this table. The, the Orthodox community, by and large, 
and what I call the committed community that exists alongside the Orthodox community sees it fairly straight. The, I don't know what word to use, the liberal, the uncommitted, whatever you want to use, the, there is an element in the community that has such a need to stand alongside the New York Times and agree with it, to stand alongside American academics and buy into their nonsense. And for whatever reason, it's, not, it's a mystical reason, it's not a logical reason, for whatever reason, we had a pass 70 years ago that was very expensive to buy that pass. We were entitled to a homeland and a country in that part of the world, but I don't believe it would have happened if people had not been in a relatively temporary state of sympathy for us. That, that's not confusing the justification and our attachment to that land with what the psychological reaction of the rest of the world, but that what, that's what I think. Seventy years later, and Jews are viewed as fat cats and successful and powerful, and I think that the liberal American Jewish community that is not adequately educated and not adequately committed thinks it wants the state of Israel to exist, but it's not what it wakes up in the morning thinking the most about. And I think that they read the garbage that's published in the liberal press, and they listen. The kids go to uh, the kind of colleges that I went to that now spew this horrible anti-Israel, uh, not just propaganda, it's like assumptions that are, that are made that are that way. They buy into it. And consequently, it must be our fault. It must be partly our fault. And it's, it's a form of insanity. I, I don't have a more logical explanation. There are some people who worry that there is, a, within American Jewry, a certain kind of fear that as good as America has been to us, because we do have a sense of history, there's a worry that one day it would change. And that if Israel does something that embarrasses or in somehow is seen to be cruel, it will come back against Us. American Jews. Do you think any of that is true? It's theoretically possible. That, that doesn't grab me. Okay. It doesn't grab me. What grabs me more is that the culture of so many Jews is to side first with the liberal point of view. And the liberal point of view is distorted and ignorant and insane about Israel, um, and maybe getting worse rather than better. And I, to me, that's more, more of a factor than worrying that Israel is. There was a long period of time in which I think people really did early. People's resistance to Israel was a, a fear that it would cause embarrassment in some way. I think I think that's largely, largely passed. It may, it may be in some, in some people's minds, but I, I more think that it's just the pull to so many Jews of leftist politics. Okay. I got a phone call from a viewer, lovely viewer, lovely phone call, who said that she's dealing with her friends all the time who say to her, the problem with Israel is you took someone else's land. I am more and more convinced, Richard, that when you peel back all of the arguments, what is at the heart of this is there are still Jews who feel guilty about Israel taking Palestinian or Arab land. When you are confronted with that argument, what do you or what would you say? Did we steal someone's land to create the state of Israel? No, of course not. I, I am sure that there were people who were seriously disadvantaged by the fact that they didn't want to stay in a Jewish state, that they didn't want the Zionists to achieve their goal of thousands of years of Jewish history. Um, I'm sure there are some stories that one could be sympathetic to, but 
nothing could be clearer than that the Jews had a claim to that land. That is, you, you don't need to believe the Bible, you just have to understand history. They were always there. Is a good question, I don't, I don't really want to get into this, but a good question whether the concept of Palestinians was, was conceived as a political device to create a people who could have been upturned by the existence of the State of Israel. I mean, we didn't think about Palestinians when the state was formed. We thought about uh, a bunch of Arab states that surrounded that piece of land. Um, and I, 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 I know that that argument is, all, is ultimately one that we're not equipped to sometimes to argue uh, in the best way and have to go to a, a heritage that we have in, in that land. But there were always Jews there. There have always been fights over territory with conflicting ethnic groups, and Zionism is, Zionism is a, a, a true and revered tradition that is, even if you don't have the sentiment that we do, a totally legitimate one. And it was one in a sense that was completely moral and in a sense that was completely legal in terms of world law existed at that time and mm -hmm. exists now. Mm -hmm. And there are territorial disputes among different ethnicities in every corner of the world. All over the world. All over the world. And this is the only one where people want to redo what, what was done 70 years ago. It's, again, it's a double standard applied to Jews that is somehow in the, at large in the world, and it's been at large for a very, very long time. Is it anti-Semitism? Sure. 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 It's, it's yes, it's a, the most virulent form of anti-Semitism uh, today. And it's just so disappointing that Jews buy into it. They buy into it. And, and, and again, I d you, you just asked, is it because they feel guilty that we took Arab land? Deep down, they're liberal Jews. There may be a few like that. They're very eccentric. What they mainly are is Jews who are not uh, who don't feel Israel in their gut is the most important fact about their lives, which I think it is the most important fact about our lives, is that we have a Jewish state. Yes. And, I, but uh, I, and, and they buy into liberal politics and academic politics. Yes. I want to say it a hair differently, and then you tell me how sure. you react to it. I can understand if there are Jews who, in their own experience of being Jews, Israel is not in the forefront of their consciousness, nor is it the number one right. concern. And I don't feel in and of itself that makes them bad. It is possible not to think that Israel is the most important thing in your Jewish life and still not be against Israel and not be critical sure. of Israel. Sure. And there are it's the criticism, it's, it's, and by the way, it's mindless. It is irrational. You know, I know that the Jew has always sided with the underdog. It's a Talmudic principle. You always side with the underdog. What people don't understand is, despite the fact that Israel has a powerful army, when you look at the Middle East as a whole, Israel remains the underdog. And I don't understand, Richard, why liberal Jews are sympathetic to a culture which treats women horribly, which literally executes gays, which is not a democratic society, which has textbooks that are virulently anti-human. Mutilates women. Mutilates women. There are honor killings in the Palestinian world. Explain to me why a liberal on college camp, why a professor <laughs> at a liberal college at Harvard or at UC Berkeley, why would they side with a community that is, is antithetical to every liberal tradition they espouse? Why? I'm all, I can only answer you with an anecdote. I, I went with Malcolm home line to Israel when he was still at the Jewish Community Relations Council. There's a relevance, I promise you. It's a long time a long ago. long time ago. 
and he, I went with, accompanied him on a trip where we took some New York politicians, most of whom were overwhelmingly impressed with everything that they saw and very, very friendly. There was one guy who um, was actually uh, not Jewish, but married to a Jewish woman. They were both there. And he had, I won't name him, he had a high up position in uh, the administration, the state administration at that time, high enough that he was a desired candidate for this trip. Everywhere we went, he had arguments, quibbles about the lack of civil rights, the rights of Palestinians, et cetera, et cetera, to a point where we went to a kibbutz and we were interviewing the guy who, the head of the kibbutz. And he asked questions about what's the status of women on this kibbutz. He says, well, I think really totally equal. We, um, we, um, we, we alternate deliberately. The chairman of the kibbutz alternates. It's two years it's a man, two years it's a woman, so we make sure that that issue is taken. Um, the only thing is that we, this, this is, it wasn't a religious kibbutz. Uh, we, we, em we emphasize the importance of, we encourage big families. So a lot of the women have spent many years uh, dealing with children rather than being in the workforce of the kibbutz. Oh, okay, I get it now. That's how you suppress them. That's how you suppress women. Okay. Now, we went to a PLO town outside of Bethlehem where we were invited by the, I forget the name of the town, but the mayor invited us to coffee and he lectured about how tough it is to be under Israeli occupation. And here's what he said. He said, we can't even operate our police. We used to, if there was a robbery, we'd pick up a suspect. By the time we got to the police station, he had a signed confession and a couple of black eyes by the time we got to the police station. Now the Israelis say we have to give him a cup of coffee, we have to read him his rights, and so on. We can't even operate our justice system. I thought this would be a wonderful, a wonderful thing. So I turned to my then, by that time, friend, and I said, you hear that? They get him in the car, and by the time they get him to the police station, he's got black eyes and he signed a confession. What do you think of that? He says, well, that's their culture. Okay, it's okay, they're doing it. That's their culture. But to encourage women to have children on a kibbutz, to say that we're in favor of children, we'll give you extra privileges if you have children, you have to worry and so on, that's suppression of women, okay? How do you make sense out of, mm -hmm. out of this? That's a fabulous story. Yeah. It's also a very sad story, yeah. Yeah. you know? But this, this is what we fight. Yes, this is what we fight. I, I said once, when I got to speak at APAC, once I used a phrase that's, that's stuck in my own head. It's good when your own phrases stick in your own head. We're dealing on a daily basis with lies so great, there's nothing to grab onto to refute them. Yes. And we all know the saw. If you tell a lie over and over and over it again. It starts to be a truth. Yes. There were many American Jews, there are many American Jews, who just detest Donald Trump. So he moves the embassy to West Jerusalem. And there are many American Jews who are very upset. I have rabbis telling me, right decision, wrong time by the wrong man. What was your reaction to Donald Trump's moving the embassy? I have found it impossible to understand how that, what he did was not done by all these different presidents who were more pro-Israel, a little less pro-Israel, more in tune with the Likud, less in tune. To me, I, I, I'm obviously missing something. The embassy is in a part of Jerusalem. Jerusalem has been considered a part of Israel since 1948, if you think Israel has any right to exist anywhere. Now, Jerusalem's a particularly sensitive spot, but the location of that embassy is in a part of Israel that everyone has always said is Israel. Part Whether of Jerusalem. Of, of Jerusalem that everyone has always said is Israel. So it isn't that the movement of that embassy from Tel Aviv to West Jerusalem is a decision by the Trump administration about what happens to the, to the rest of Jerusalem in a, the post-67 parts of Jerusalem in a negotiation, which, which is a, a sensitive issue if ever there were a negotiation and if ever there was a possible deal. It doesn't say anything about that. But somehow, it, what it, I think it's a message 
to the Arab world that Israel's here to stay. We're, we're, they're a country, and they can pick where their capital is. We're not saying, they can't necessarily say right now what territory they're going to keep that was post-67. I would hope that they get all of Jerusalem, I'm not conceding anything. But this move didn't do any of that. And what Trump's actual motive was, I'm not sure. Uh, but why didn't Clinton do that? Why didn't W. Bush uh, do that? I don't, I don't understand. Um, and, you didn't say Obama. Uh, well, Obama, I understand, is more consistent with Obama's uh, way of dealing with this. But um, the fact that there were almost no outcry, there was nothing but the most token outcry from most of the Arab world, other than Europe, Europe spoke much more loudly about it in the Arab world. I assume Bibi had actually discussed this. I think they all... Um, they all knew that this was going to happen. I think is a very loud message. The, the Arab, the, the the Sunni states did nothing different because of this. Nothing. A little, well, they, couple of them made. They made the the Saudis made statements about this that were less uh, vehement than some of the Jewish organizations in America. That's yes. really crazy. Yes. That's yes. really crazy. Um, so I, I I don't understand, and I think I think in fact that a few months later, that as we get used to this and recognize that it hasn't changed anything on the ground other than that it's another nail in the coffin of the Arab delusion that uh, Israel is not there to stay, I, I, I think that you don't see too much criticism today among Jew the Jewish organizations that were out front about it, I won't name them, have backtracked or at least kept quiet about it since then. All right, and what about Donald Trump's nullifying the Iran deal? I don't think that the Jewish community, e even those who backed Obama and did not object to the deal, I, I think that across the board there's been a discomfort about that deal. I don't th think that People who are who play in the Jewish community, even that play largely from the left, were totally pleased. Something about that deal, they may have supported it, but something about that deal, you could sense a discomfort even, even in those who, who supported Obama. And I think that what Trump has done, has the response to it has been very muted by Jewish supporters of the bill originally. People recognize that Iran is a bad, bad place in its current regime. Of course, right now, the, the, act the enlivened reaction in Iran from these, some of these protests, which I suspect we're seeing the tip of the, maybe squelched, but I suspect we're seeing the tip of the iceberg. We're not, we haven't heard the last of this, uh, what's going on there now, uh, and, the, and the chance of death to Palestine. That's an amazing, and that being reported all over the place. That's clearly happening. It's not just something that, a, that the Jewish, a couple of right-wing Jewish papers uh, have picked up. I think that, um, that this, com compared to the, to the flack Trump is getting on some immigration issues, for example, I think the response to this has been appropriately muted and reflects a, an ambivalence about that deal, even in, the, even in the hands of people who supported it. You were pleased he moved the embassy. Were you pleased he took this action in relationship to the Iran deal? Yeah, I was. I, I, I was. Um, <coughs> I, I don't think it will change anything for the worse. I don't think it's a little hard to predict. But I, 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 I would say I'm definitely okay. for it. Okay. Richard, you have referenced the BDS movement on college campus. Can you talk for one minute about what you think the American Jewish response should be if you feel a Jewish response can be effective? The logistics of fighting the BDS movement are very difficult. It's part of the broader question of fighting the, the more specific, but it's part of the broader question of fighting the incredible double standard lies that are told about the state of Israel. The BDS movement is 
founded in the notion that Israel is a state that behaves with a morality that can't be defended, and that is crazy. Um, but the, we, we, we've talked for decades now about delivering a better message. And I don't think, I'm not sure how you do that. I'm not sure how you educate people who are prone to think so badly about Israel that they report to, they resort to the BDS movement. I don't know how you correct their views. We've tried to do that for a very long time. There's an almost inexorable force, mystical force, that, that moves it, that we've referred to in a number of contexts. I think that um, Jewish uh, supporters of universities ought to be on top of that and make, make it very clear. The administrations of these universities, by and large, really don't want the trouble that comes from uh, BDS starting in the year. It, it, it doesn't, it, it gets stopped most of the time at a, at, a, at a high level where the college, the university doesn't want to destroy itself over something that they have a tangential belief in if they have any belief at all. And so I think that um, it makes a lot of sense to stay on top of it and make sure that local Jewish communities are watching the universities in their own towns and making it clear that this is not something that, that's going to happen without sanctions and so on. Uh, it would be great if we figured out better formulas, Hasbara formulas for terminating it, but I think it's part of the broad, it's part of the broad question. And if you read the New York Times, you, it gives you a great background to support BDS. The, the President's Conference has a lot of activity devoted to this. Uh, it's an important topic, obviously. Where does it go? Where does it get us? We do manage to get um, through the Lawfare Project in particular, uh, which is an affiliate kind of a conference, and your very good friend who's on this channel quite a bit, uh, Brooke Goldstein, who does a great job, and that, that project does a great job. Um, uh, they, they do manage to get some of the worst situations. Uh, uh, they certainly give a lot of colleges and the universities the notion that they're being watched. Is the Lawfare Project a right-wing project? I don't think so. Is it's Brooke, perceived that way. You why, Richard, why yeah. is that? Why is it that if you defend Can I Israel, ask you something, yes. do, you, do you think Bibi is? A, do you see him as a right winger? Is that how you see Bibi? No, for example? I don't. It, it, it's increasingly the case that seeing things straight, seeing the facts straight, and commitment is viewed as right wing in the context of Israel. Yes, yes. I don't view myself as a right winger. I, I don't. And I'm certainly not a right winger. <laughs> but if you see things clearly, then you You're see the, then you right. see the truth. Yeah, and uh, that's what we're fighting, Richard. Correct. Uh, both you and I. We spoke about this a little bit, but I want to sort of end here, Richard. There are those who are worried that the enmity that seems to be within the American society is not limited to Americans in general, but is also now inside the Jewish community. I want your sense of what concerns you about the way in which Jews interact with Jews here in America and what your, you know, what your optimistic hope is. Well, I'm very worried about how Jews interact with Jews. There are some fundamental, if we want to consider ourselves a community as Jews, as opposed to a bunch of people who have who share Jewish ancestry, and we want to act as a community, it's become increasingly difficult to do so with unanimity and maybe even with consensus. But as I've said a number of times, I think what's really important is to maintain a very strong, committed community that maintains I, when I say traditional values, I'm not talking about religious observance, although that's, I, in my mind, very important also. And it's the core of everything. But maintains the traditional loyalties to the Jewish people, which now means to the state of Israel, that, among other things, enable you to see what's true and not get caught up in the mm -hmm. lies and the craziness mm -hmm. and not get caught up in double, triple, quadruple standards that distort reality in a way that to me is insane, no less than insane. And as for the rest of the community, I, I would hope that 
we can figure out more and more ways to bring them in. I, as I've said to you earlier, I think that increasing Jewish education by about a, multiplying it by about 200 would be one thing that would be potentially helpful in, 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 in creating more commitment in that part of the community, uh, in being able to articulate the fact that Jewish values uh, do not stop with liberal democratic politics. But I am very worried that a large segment of the community, I don't even think it's going to be so much a question of division and strife. I think it's going to be going separate ways and increasingly not being relevant to the, to the Jewish scene. There'll be relevant Americans in their own way. And, but but I, I, I feel that we, some decades from now, it's going to be clear that a piece of the community sadly lopped itself off. But I think there's going to be great strength in, in the committed community. And it could come from a lot of different sources, the internal growth of orthodoxy, and particularly, believe it or not, Mark, in the um, parts of the Karate community are becoming more and more involved with Israel issues. And that's got enormous potential. There's tremendous sophistication, wealth, and power in that community that is starting to be seriously harnessed. And I, I think that's going to continue to to be a, a major factor. And and there are lots of Jews like you, Mark. And and I think I think there ought to be a lot there ought to be a lot more Jews like you who see the real issues, who have the commitment, and are not necessarily identified with uh, with the, the Orthodox community. Um, so that that's my optimism. But in the process, I am concerned that we're going to inevitably lose a segment and, and some serious, sad numbers that will survive and without it. You are doing marvelous work helping us to survive. You know, I, I, I think you're fabulous, and I love you very much. And the fact that you've given me so much time and counsel and we've talked, we've talked so many times off camera. This is wonderful to have you on camera. But I want you to know you mean the world to me. And I wish everybody knew you as well as I did. You are, you are a model of what a mensch is and what a committed Jew is. And I am proud, proud to call you my friend. Even more than that, Mark, I'm a model of a fan of JBS. I, I, I always love being in my home in East Hampton. But one of the reasons for the last number of years that I've loved it is that I can flick on JBS in one second and I watch, I watch everything, sometimes twice over there. And now you're coming to Manhattan and that's, that's a big joy to me also. The work you do is terrific and we need you. So okay. stay with us. We're not ending, we're just pausing. Right. A right. deal? <laughs> deal. A deal. Fun. Richard Stone, former chairman of the National Conference of Soviet Jewry and former chairman of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations. It has been an honor having him here at this table. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed here on L'Chaim. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. The high of my friends to life. Jewish education in media.